We want to finish um, the deep learning as one can finish deep learning and uh, move on to the new subject. We still have to talk a little bit about um, some aspect uh, of deep learning. And one thing that is uh, important is overfitting in deep learning is a serious issue, actually more, more than of issue than um, in shallow networks. And what we can do against it There are several things we can do. One is augmentation. Of course, you overfit maybe because you don't have enough data. So augmentation for us in computer vision could be translation, could be rotation, could be scaling. So you take the image and shift it a little bit up, down, left, right. Rotation, you rotate it to the left, to the right. Of course, if you are working on face recognition, that's not going to work. So it's limited, but translation going to work, scaling going to work. So augmentation, we increase, basically, the size of the training data. And by doing that, we, we hope that we can counteract the overfitting. Because if you have more data, it's less likely that you overfit. <clears throat> we can also stop the learning early, so early stopping. So if we have our typical um, diagram for uh, error versus uh, the, the episode of learning or episodes of learning. So usually in the training, you get something like this. And in testing, we get something like this. So then we can say, that we are overfitting. So if that discrepancy becomes big between the trained and learned, so one, one thing would be OK. Maybe we stop here. So of course, we, if we do cr cr careful cross-validation, we can easily um, do that. So usually what? prevents us from not doing that is the greed. We want to be more accurate. Um, new techniques, newer techniques, dropout. Dropout is one of the techniques that people use to uh, counteract overfitting in deep learning. So basically what you do, you randomly remove some neurons. So if I send, if I set the weights, the connections of a neuron to zero, or almost to zero, basically I'm removing that neuron. So that's, uh, that's one way of doing it. But what happens, if you do that, then the network becomes uh, sensitive or more sensitive to individual neurons. And that results into better generalization. So you can imagine that you are, you are running the learning, and you suddenly drop a neuron. 
So you remove it. That, that will completely confuse the network for a short amount of time because what was learned was considering everything in that neuron that will affect the output. So the network has to come up with some ideas to counteract that. So the network has to keep what it has learned without that neuron or those neurons. So it makes the network more creative, so to speak. That just don't throw everything away. Try to keep what you have learned without, I don't know, the 5% of neurons that are not there. So then the fine tuning and gradient descent will have more effect on individual neurons. So that's, the, that's that sensitivity that um, is, uh, we talk about. So interestingly, we can show empirically that the dropout concept is basically equivalent to averaging several models. That's very interesting. So which means it, it's, it's as if you train multiple networks and then you take an average. But of course, training multiple networks and taking the average is much more difficult than dropout. And four, which many people also use that, well, dropout became quite, um, quite uh, popular. But weight penalties uh, using L2 or L1 norms for distance are quite common too. So the error that we calculate usually is the total error of the network. We modify that by calculating error star plus the magnitude of all weights, or I can do the same thing, total error plus using the, using the uh, Euclidean distance to calculate error. So the question is, what does do th that do? The, that makes the network to do the job with small weights, not big weights. So why is that of any use? So if I, if I try to reach the lowest error by learning small weights, so what is the difference that I do the same thing with big weights, with large weights? So putting penalty on big weights forces the network to stay in a very narrow domain. So at the beginning, you have a lot of error. It has to go down the hill and get to small value and stay there. And since the large values of the weights are penalized, it cannot choose big values. So it stays there and does some local fine tuning to get there. So and this has also, of course, this is, has also something to do with the Occam's razor. You have to choose the smallest weight space, not the big weight space. So the smallest weight space tend to be more reasonable for calcul uh, calculating the, uh, the best model. So the, small, the model with smaller weights is better. It's, it's something that, if you remember, we actually, at the beginning, when we talked about generalization and overfitting, these are our regularizer. So it will help the network to, it will help the network to not only, so if you focus too much on the total error, You may get into local minima, you may push it, you become greedy, and then you get overfitted, and so on and so on. But if I try to minimize the total error, at the same time I try to do it with small 
weight space, that has a bigger chance to be a good model. OK. So, so far, we are talking about learning. And there are different type of learning that we have mentioned. And maybe we have seen some example for some of them. One was unsupervised. Unsupervised learning. And we had the example of SOM, self-organizing math. And when we talk about unsupervised learning, that means there is no labeled data. Then we also learned supervised learning. And supervised learning, one, well, multi-layer perceptron, perceptron, um, CNNs, uh, autoencoders, they're all supervised learning. Because you know where you want to go, which means you have labeled data. So there is a third category of learning that we have not talked about. And that's weakly supervised. Weakly supervised. And so far, we have not talked anything weakly supervised. And one major group is reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning, or RL. So in reinforcement learning, the question is not label data or not label data. The question is a reinforcement signal. Reinforcement signal. So there is a signal that guides the learning. So hence, you don't need label data, and you don't work in the same way that unsupervised learning works, is a different type of learning. Some people confuse it with neural network. Reinforcement learnings are not. So RL, and when we talk about reinforcement learning, usually we talk about RL agents. So they come from. They come from the general field of AI. They have been around for quite some time. They come from control theory. So this is something we understand. They come from operation research. They have some roots in all these fields, operation research. Uh, they have something to do with psychology. And they have something to do with cognitive science. Cognitive science. So is a field that is multidisciplinary for quite some time, has been on the margin of AI. Um, some people mistake it with some type of neural network. And they put it actually in a chapter in textbooks. They put it in, a, in the chapter with neural network. But it's not a neural network. So reinforcement learning is learning through interaction. So which means learning by doing. So which means learning from scratch. So this is the first time that you're talking about something that can actually start from scratch. You don't have a model. You don't have a distance measurement like the uh, self-organizing map. You don't have uh, labeled data to calculate the error. 
You don't have any of that. So you learn by doing something from scratch. So I'm pretty sure whatever that is, whatever that is, it's uh, something that you make big mistakes at the beginning. So, so the reinforcement learning goal is basically the control of large scale stochastic environments with partial knowledge. So there are two, three keywords here. So first of all, it's large scale, then it's a stochastic, and you have partial knowledge. And generally, we are not talking about the model, we are not talking about the problem, we are not talking about classification. The interaction is with an environment, whatever that means. So the applications of reinforcement learning, there are many. So for example, scheduling. Scheduling, for example, and not just scheduling in the large repositories, also scheduling like dynamic channel allocation. And that channel being, that channel being uh, communication channels, network channels, internet channels, cellular phone channels, and so on. So how do you schedule a task? Still, a large part of the internet is actually fixed. So we have lookup tables, and we allocate bandwidth uh, manually. So if, I don't know, if New York, Chicago needs more bandwidth, is manually allocated and say, OK, take this much. Because this is, this is the hardest problem there is. How can you dynamically allocate bandwidth on the internet? That's a so-called NP-hard problem. So you cannot easily do that because you have several million of parameters. And they dynamically change. It's not fixed that you download a set of data and then you train. <clears throat> so of course, board games. Uh, historically, Pac-Gamon has been one. That was the first, one of the first games that reinforcement learning was quiet and successful with checkers. Go, chess, and so on. So why is that important? Well, Go is one of the really, I don't know which one is more difficult. I would say Go is on the top. So why is that important that you apply AI on, on games? Well, uh, playing a game requires intelligence. So if you can play the game, that means you have a certain level of intelligence. Robotics, of course. Um, historical examples, robo soccer, and elevator control. When you think of robotics, you may not think of elevator control as an example, but it is. So the the mechanical part plus the software that controls the elevator is a robotic system. It's not, it's not as obvious as a robot moving around the room with human-like appearance, but it is a robotic system. So, OK. So what is this reinforcement learning? So if you have a 
reinforcement learning agent, again, so now you're learning a new uh, terminology, which is a piece of software, basically. Then this reinforcement learning agent will interact with an environment. And I drew this as an irregular shape because this environment is a stochastic and dynamic. So it's dynamic, a stochastic, maybe non-stationary, non-stationary, and so on. So it's, an, it's a nasty environment. It's a difficult environment. So the reinforcement learning agent, take a look at the state of the environment. So what is the state of the environment? So what's going on in the system? And takes an action. The action of the reinforcement learning agent has to affect, has to affect the environment. See, it's completely different from everything that we have talked about so far. You take a trained neural network and you train it, you give it to somebody, that network makes a decision. Somebody looks at it and says, no, I don't take it. Or even if that decision is automatically taken, it doesn't really directly affect the dynamic environment because there is no then feedback into the network. The network makes decisions detached from the dynamic environment. We don't use most neural networks to, to engage with dynamic environments, typical engineering environments. We don't do that because neural networks cannot deal with that. So you take an action and the state changes. So if you do that, If you do that, there will be a reinforcement, reinforcement signal coming back from the environment. So you do something with the environment, and the environment tells you what's going on. What does that mean? So the environment is my elevator system. I have hundred floors and I have four elevators and they are going up and down. I'm sending them up and down. The reinforcement agent is sending it up and down. And then you take an action. You say elevator number one, go up. Elevator number two, go down. Elevator number three, stay where you are. Elevator number four, go up. So you have a set of actions. And then you listen again, and you measure, let's say, the waiting time of passengers, and you see the waiting time of passengers went up. So you didn't take the right actions. That's the reinforcement signal. What the system tells you, what's going on. So the reinforcement, you, you realize this is something totally different. So the reinforcement signal is basically reward or punishment. So controlling, reinforcement learning is all about control. Controlling any dynamic environment. any dynamic environment means to find the trade-off, the trade-off between exploration and exploitation and ex exploitation so what does that supposed to be 
So exploration means look for knowledge. And exploitation means use your knowledge. Now, we said that reinforcement learning is learning through interaction, learning by doing, learning from scratch. There is no label, there is no model, there is no equation, there is no data. There is no data. OK, if there is no data, what should I do? Why you wait, you interact, you get one signal. You start from scratch. It's Monday morning, you run the reinforcement learning agent. It randomly sends the elevators up and down, just randomly. And of course, Monday morning will be a mess because most of those actions will be wrong. So, and you get punishment after punishment. So what is the punishment? Well, some negative numbers perhaps that you accumulate as an agent. So you don't know anything. You don't know the density of people. You don't know how many times the passenger will press the button for the fifth floor. So you have to look for knowledge, which means you have to really explore and take random actions. Just take random actions. Do you have any other way to gain knowledge? You have to take random actions. But after a while that you get some idea about, OK, this is E7. And we have three elevators. One of them is in distance with the others. So it has a totally different distribution. And at 515, is heavily used on Tuesdays and Thursdays. OK, so start exploiting that knowledge. So keep it, keep it more ready at the lowest floor and the fifth floor. For example, so exploration versus exploitation. There is no such a thing in neural network. It doesn't mean anything for artificial neural networks. Artificial neural networks, you have static data. The data that we use in artificial neural networks are static. They are not dynamic. So there are. The RL agent influences the state distribution. The state distribution. Hence, it makes decisions. or takes actions to maximize reward or minimize, minimize punishment. Minimize punishment. So, OK, that means everything we knew about neural networks doesn't help us. So we have to come up with something new, something that can help us with a dynamic environment. So then we will be working with state S that will come from a capital A S to set up all states. We will have to take some actions that come from a set of actions that contain all admissible actions. So we are redefining the learning problem. Then we have an R, which is our reward function. So somebody has to give me a reward. And we have a delta which is our transition probability. Which is OK, so what is the delta of S1 to S2? Something like this. 
So what is the probability that I'm in state S1, I take the action A, and then I go to S2? What is the probability that I move some figures on the chessboard and then I can win? Well, this is a Markov decision process. MDP. So that's a Markov decision process. You have some states, you take some actions, you take some reward and punishment for your actions, most of the time, you may know the transition probabilities that takes you from one state to another state. And if you repeatedly, infinitely take actions, you will get into the ideal state or terminal state. What is the term? Do you have all systems terminal state? No. Elevator system have terminal state. Maybe we shut them down at midnight. OK, that's the terminal state. But then we have to maintain the optimal results, which is keep the waiting time of passengers uh, minimum. So now we have our stochastic environment. And we have some states that we visualize with these circles. And one of them is this state S. And then we take we take an action A. Now, the action A may take me with a probability of 0 0.8 to S prime, or it may take me with a probability of 0 0.2 to S double prime. That's an stochastic environment. You see, face recognition is not a stochastic environment. You recognize the face, you're done. There's nothing stochastic about it. It's not even dynamic. I show you the image. I keep it for you two hours. Look at it as much as you want. It's a static problem. Things are not changing. The shape, the face is not morphing into, I don't know, another person. So taking taking action A in state S causes the transition the transition delta S A S prime with probability of 0 0.8 and delta S A S double prime with probability of 0 0.2. So we also write the probability of S prime, S prime given S and A is 0 0.8. And the probability of S double prime given S and A is 0 0.2. So we can write it as conditional probabilities. So what is the probability that I can get to the state S prime? If I'm already, if at the moment I'm at S, and then I take action A, whatever action A is. So the RSA, so the return function or the reward function, is the reward for action A taken in state S. 
Was that action a good action? How do I know that? OK, now here the dilemma of weekly supervised learning. You don't have a teacher. You don't have distance. If you have teacher, you do MLP, CNN, autoencoder. If you don't have teacher, you do support vector, um, you do uh, self-organizing maps, you calculate distances. So if you don't have any of that, well, I need at least a reinforcement signal. Somebody has to tell me was it right or was it wrong. But how it happens is indirect. So this is indirect guidance. So is like you, you, you punish, let's say, professors. So they are supposed to good, do good teaching and publish papers and so on. So at the end, they get evaluated at the end of the year. So and they get feedback why they are getting low or high evaluation. So let's say we don't tell the professor why he's getting a low value, but if we give him low value. He has not published many papers, and his teaching evaluations are low. We give him very low value. It's between zero, 0 0.5 to 2. 2 is outstanding. 0 0.5 is even if you just show up on the campus, you get 0 0.5. So everybody's complaining about you. Nobody cares. 0 0.5 because you have tenure. That's good enough. That's 3% salary increase in a year. So why should I do more effort? So, but if I get 0 0.5 and nobody tells me why I'm getting 0 0.5, so 0 0.5 is reinforcement signal, but nobody's telling me you are getting 0 0.5 because your teaching is low. So second year, I get 0 0.5. Third year, I get 0 0.5. And I ask again, why am I getting 0 0.5? Nobody tells me anything. And then one year, I just I have a good year, and I have a good class, and I, my teaching is OK, and I randomly pop good, two good students, and they write some papers for me. And, and then suddenly, I get 1.75. And I ask, what happened? Nobody tells me anything. So over time, I figure it out as the stupid professor that if I do my teaching and publish papers, I get high evaluation. So that's indirect guidance. If somebody tells me you are getting 0 0.5 because you are a bad teacher, that's not reinforcement learning. Because then it tells me what to do. That would be supervised learning. Because then I know what to do. OK, go and suck up to the students. <laughs> then you get high marks. Or publish papers in below average conferences. So, but nobody tells me what to do. That's very important, that you don't know. That's indirect guidance. So you get, you get reinforcement signal. You get reward and punishment. But you don't know why you are getting reward and punishment. So why are you not telling them? Why not? Well, the system is dynamic and stochastic. You have millions and millions of states. We don't know what is right and what is wrong. Nobody knows what is right and what is wrong. At any snapshot that you take from the three, three elevators here in this building, how do you know what is the best action? Every elevator can stay there, go up or go down. And you have three of them. What is the best action at any given weekday, at any given time? We don't know. So nobody knows to give you direct guidance. But we have an indirect guidance. Just add up the total waiting time of everybody in the building. That time has to be minimized. OK, that time is your punishment. So I want to make the punishment go to 0. That means the waiting time has to go towards 0. Yes? No, because the error comes from direct comparison of what I am calculating and what it should be. Here, we don't know what it should be. 
what is the best situation for elevators? I don't know. Nobody is in the building? <laughs> we don't know what is the optimal state. The optimal state is everybody just, you press the button and the elevator comes immediately? That's not going to happen. It just the resources are limited. So we don't know the target. There is no target to calculate the error. OK. It, it becomes more clear when we, when we go a little bit ahead. So for example, we can say that the reward for SA is plus 10 with probability of 0 0.1. We can say the reward for SA is zero is plus five with probability of 0 0.3. We can say the reward for SA is minus five with probability of 0 0.6. So the reward that I get when I'm in state S and I take an action. That's actually a function of where am I going? So if I'm at S and I take action A, then if it brings me to S prime with a probability of 0 0.8, the question is, is S prime a good state to be in? Is S prime good? We don't know. So if you're playing chess and I move this figure from this here, from here to here, I have a no, new board configuration. Is that a better configuration? Am I in a better situation than before? Sometimes you don't know until you do more moves. And then you find out, oh, that was not a, such a good move. Now I'm losing. So it could be that we don't know what is the value of the state until we get to a point in the future. So. We have also, we have, to, we have to follow, so hence we have to follow what we call trajectories. Trajectories. So you say, I start at S, take action one it brings me to S prime. Then I take action two, it brings me to S double prime. And then I take action three, it brings me to state triple prime, and so on. So you can come up that I'm starting here, then going here, then going here, then I may come here, from here I may come here, from here I may go here, and so on. So there is a trajectory when I start from S. So a trajectory, so I come here, then I go here, then I go here, then I go here. So this could be a terminal state, for example. Is there such a thing? Sometimes there is. What is a terminal state? We play chess, somebody wins. Boom, done. Terminal state. In elevator system, perhaps there is no terminal state. Because it's just episodal. Just keep doing what you are doing. There is no winning. Just, just, just try to keep everybody happy. But the trajectory means the collection of actions that brings me from state to state and a state again, so to me, in my mind, the best way to understand state is look at the, any board configuration of any game, any board game, and make a snapshot of that. That's your state. That's your state. My figures are here, your figures are here. And you make a move, you make a move suddenly we are in a different state. So elevator goes up, you are in a different state. The robot moves to the link, you are in a different state. And again, keep in mind every example that I'm mentioning are dynamic, stochastic environment. 
people do have you have you seen that that uh, video of the AlphaGo? So just random moves, and suddenly people are thrown out of their concept and say, "What? What is that? That must be extremely intelligent." No, that was just a random move. And then the human operator loses his concept. I say, "Oh my God, so what should do? That must be an extremely intelligent move." No, that was a stupid move. <laughs> Exploration that was not exploitative. But OK, so we are going a bit slow because reinforcement is a new concept for us. So classic example in old textbook, if you grab the reinforcement learning book by Richard Satin and Bartow, this is one of the examples in it, the so-called N-armed bandits, N-armed bandits. So you go to the casino, and you put your money in these machines, and you use that handle to play games. Uh, I may do that in four or five years when I'm retired, so but not now. OK. So what is the strategy? You go to Las Vegas, and you are a smart guy, and you have taken an AI course, and say, we know better. What's the best strategy to play this and at the slot machines? What is, what is the good strategy? So you stick with one machine? Or you play five minutes here, five minutes here, five minutes here. What happens if you win at one machine? You say, oh, OK, that's a winning machine. I stick with it. And you see those senior citizens, they don't move at all. So this machine is $10, and I stay here. So what is the best strategy? That's a dynamic, stochastic environment, clearly, insanely stochastic. It cannot be more stochastic than this. So what is the optimal playing strategy? So which is for us the question, how to maximize, how to maximize the sum of the sum of wins. Of course, the wins for us are the rewards, right? Here's a, it could be terminal if I'm not greedy. So I play here for 10 minutes, and I win, and then I go home. But we don't do that. So usually, we stay there until you have spent your daily allowance for your debit card, and the credit card is maxed out. and. People come and throw you out and say, come on, no money anymore. Go out, get out. So what is the strategy? We want to maximize the sum of wins. So two scenarios. Scenario A, stick to the machine. Stick to the machine with high payout. High payout. So that's exploitation, right? So you are exploiting. One machine, you, you win something at it, you stick with it, you don't move, say that's it, let me spend my money here. So that's exploitation. You have a little bit of knowledge, you just keep applying that knowledge again and again. You don't want to learn anymore because you don't want to take any risk. Exploit it. Scenario B. Frequently, switch between machines. So do five minutes here, five minutes there. So that's clearly exploring. Explore. 
Okay, is that smart? I, I go from here to here, and then five minutes here, five minutes there. Then what? I may just get physically tired, and I cannot continue. So the challenge is there is no supervision. No supervision. But there is reward. If you, if you treat the n arm banded problem like a supervised learning problem, you will lose. There is nobody to teach you. So if you do exploitation, that means you are after short-term reward. Short-term reward. Uh, you want to you wanna have your $10. OK, get your $10. You see that the stock market goes up. People who have no knowledge, no financial economic knowledge, they go and, hey, OK, let's, let's buy $200. It's going up. Apple is going up. That's exploitative. You may make some bucks. That's OK. What is short term? Exploitation, exploration, sorry. Exploration is for the patient guy. It's about long term. It's about long term return. So I'm playing my strategy there, going from machine to machine. People come and go. They win $10, $20, $50—and I just had $5, $6. And they just exploit, sticking with that machine. But I'm going from machine to machine. I'm exploring. If you stay 10 hours, you will see that I will win. I will win more. So also, early versus late rewards, are they the same? If you make a smart move at the beginning of the chess, it's just, you just started the game, and you make one of those moves that you can learn on YouTube. Yeah. So here, and then people get impressed. Or you make a smart move toward the end when there is a blockade, and nobody knows who would win. Which one is more valuable? Good actions at the beginning, or good actions at the end? Perhaps at the end. So early rewards, yeah, they're not bad. But late rewards, so which means we have, exploit, we have explored a lot. And now things are getting to the terminal state. If I get rewards there, I'm really smart. Is, is, is your system or environment well, environment, you've abused the word system so much. Is your environment endless or terminal? That's a big question. The Mars rover, is it a terminal system or is it an endless system? Well, every day that the Mars rover goes out, it has a certain goal. It goes there, 25 kilometers to the northeast, grab some samples, come back. So it's terminal per day. Has a specific goal, go there, get your job done, come back. Is the elevator system endless or terminal? Is the chess go, checkers game, endless or terminal? 
So we have to answer this question for reinforcement agent. Is the problem that I'm trying to solve, is it endless? It goes forever? Or it ends at some point? Because if it is end, it's episodal learning. If it goes forever, OK, so nobody can really check me. I have to just try it every time. I have to just do my best. So we know that the driving force of learning in artificial neural networks, A and Ns, is the error. So the error was the driving force. The driving force of learning in reinforcement learning is the return. So how much am I getting out of this? So if the reinforcement signal is positive, I want to accumulate that. If the reinforcement signal is negative, I want to minimize that. The return. And the return could be endless or it could be terminal. So either you, I have episodes or it's continuous and ongoing. So the return is in bracket discounted sum of rewards. So for every action, I get a reward. For every action, I get a reward. I add them up, that's my return. But if I'm smart, and I know that late rewards are more valuable than early rewards, I calculate a discounted sum of rewards, which means the more you go ahead, the rewards become more valuable. Because no, I'm really trying to wrestle with the environment to figure it out. And I'm getting close to the nine stationary solution, and it moves from this location to that location. I'm getting really close. So discounted means weighted. So the late rewards have higher weights. Should, should have higher weights. That's, that's to us, because that's how we design it. OK. So then for return, to calculate return, we have two cases. Either we say you have a finite horizon, so your application is terminal, then your return is the sum of the reward of SI AI, I goes from 1 to n. So it's terminal. You go n steps, n iterations, n observations, n measurements. And in each state, I take action. And for that action in that state that brings me to another state, I get some rewards. I add them up. So that's our maybe total. And second, if I have an infinite horizon, which means my application is endless or continuous, then my return total is the sum of a gamma raised to power of i, r of s i a i, i goes from 0 to infinity. And this gamma i is less than 1, is my discount, discount weight, if I want to call it that way. I 
I can define it in many different ways. Just given an example. So what is the condition? You are trying to, you are trying to understand the concept behind reinforcement learning. And most likely, we only need two or three equations to put it in place. It's one of those really interesting subjects. For those two, three equations, we may be forced to do four or five pages of equations to create those two equations. That's a different story. But to implement a reinforcement learning agent, we should not need more than two, three equations. Yes. Sorry? It's a, it's a discount weight because I'm going from zero to infinity. That means I want to bring in somehow what is the value of the rewards that I'm getting. If it is terminal, then the value of rewards are the same because I go 200 steps, 300 steps. But if I go infinity, how do I do it? Are the early values more valuable? High, later values are more valuable? I have to bring that into the design, yes. In this uh, formula, yes. Yes. Depend on application. It could be when I'm the Marsro, when I go out and I figure out the direction in the first early steps, that's very valuable. And then I get there, the rest is easy. So it's a design question. So condition. We have to. Measure, well, measure may be a wrong word. Visit all states. The convergence of, rain, of uh, artificial neural network, what is it? You have some data and you put through it, you go through many, many steps and you see that the error goes down and then somewhere you stop and say, okay, that's good enough for me. I did k-fold cross-validation, I'm good. So how do we know that we learn in reinforcement learning? How do I know that if I train, if I design, designing, designing the actual agent for playing chess, checkers or go, is a matter of two hours? But the states will kill you because the designing the states takes some time. Because I have to come up with a discrete representation of the states of the board. That would take some time. Yes. What is the finite horizon? So uh, depending on the, the type of function that I'm using, I get some values here. I wrote some values. Zero. Usually, like the weights in a network are small values. We don't want to accumulate big numbers. But that's based on whether I know the transition probabilities of going from state to a state. Do I know that or I don't know that? So if this is the robot and I'm moving from south to east, is that a good action? What is the value of the east? Do I know that? If I know that, then I can assign reward. Maybe I don't know that. If I don't know that, then it will impact my design. How do I know that the reward, the total return that I get, is telling me that my agent has learned something? So what is the condition for learning? I have to measure or visit all states. You have to measure all states. So if this is the space that your uh, robot has to learn to navigate, that means if I break it down in one foot by one foot square foot, right? One foot by one foot, discretize it. The agent has to visit every one foot by one foot space multiple times. Then you converge. Wow. So how many different states do you have in chess? Just look at how many different configurations you can have. My, my figure is here, your figure is here, my figure is here, your figure is here. How many do you have? Millions and millions. Actually, it's around 10 to 2 to 400. 2 to 400. 
at some point we will calculate that. Why is it 2 to 400? So you have 2 to 400 different configurations. You have 2 to 400 states. And I am supposed to visit all of them. So converging for reinforcement agent is much more challenging than for artificial neural network. Why? Because for artificial neural network, you are sitting in the lab. The window is closed. Everything is static. Nobody is looking. The network sucks. Just scrap it. Come up with another one. Reinforcement agent, you are moving in the field. Of course, we don't do that. So we try to do some simulation in the lab and send it with something, not from scratch. But it could go from scratch. You don't want to have a Mars rover on the Mars from scratch. <laughs> that, would, that would put some strains on the battery. So we have to visit all states. Wow, that's, that's a tough thing to do. So, OK. If I ignore the equations for return, we have not seen any equations yet for reinforcement learning. OK. Can we? Can we visit all states? Can we visit all states? Is the environment observable? Is chess observable? Of course. I see me, I see my opponent, we are playing. I see his hand or her hand. Everything is observable. Is an elevator system observable? Which means what? Can I see everything that affects the functioning of the elevator system? I see them going up and down. I see passengers. Do I, do I see the maintenance team that may stop one of the elevators? If I don't see, then the elevator system is not observable to me. If there is a variable in the environment that I don't see, then the system is not fully observable. So how should I regulate a system that is not observable? <laughs> Something comes and plays with hidden variables. Are there, are there hidden variables? So basically, we need to, I'm just writing down the process of designing a first reinforcement agent. So just the basic idea, interaction, reward, endless, terminal, going from state to state. We have to know the probability. OK, so we need to map states to actions states to actions. So this is called, this is called a policy. The policy, we usually call it pi. The policy pi maps the states to actions. Okay, we're going back to the Markov decision process. I need to learn a policy. So that's, that's the goal of the learning now. I need to learn a policy that in every state tells me what is the best action. So if I'm the robot and I'm moving and I get here and there is an obstacle, what is the best action? Trying to go over it, go to the left, go to the right, Go back, so what is the best action? 
That optimal policy should tell me what is the best action in every situation. I move my king from here to here, my opponent does this, what is the best action? So we need to learn a policy. A reinforcement learning learns a policy. A policy is mapping a state S to action A. Is that it? Is that it? So this is the policy, and I have S1, S2, up to Sn, and I have A1, A2, up to Am. Is that it? We want to learn a table? Perhaps the easiest way of implementing a reinforcement learning agent is learning a table. The policy will be put into a table, into a lookup table. But this is a lookup table that is changing all the time because we are still exploring. But I also exploit it, and any time that I don't know what to do, I say, okay, in state number two, I know that action number two is the best because I got most of my rewards for state number two when I took the action number two. Okay. I don't have any other choice, so I saw this obstacle. I go to the link, to the left. So, okay, maybe, maybe that's not the best action, but I don't know anything better. So learning a policy could be in simplest way to learn a table, something that we call tabular reinforcement learning. So you learn a table. You learn a lookup table. You learn a very smart lookup table. If I find the best action for all states, if I find the best action for all states, every state that you give me, this is the optimal policy. And we say optimal policy P star, uh, sorry, pi star. So if I can find in every, in every one of them, so for S1, this is the best action. For S2, this is the best action. For Sn, this is the best action. If I know that, I converged. Now I know it. I can give you, in every state, I can give you the best action. Then nobody can beat you in chess if you have the optimal policy. Your elevator system will not be like the one in E7. Definitely not. This is not an optimal. There, there is no control. It's, isn't that ironic that you have always the worst type of control system in engineering buildings? We should do a capstone project on our elevator system. It would be much better. So, okay. Things are getting clearer for me. When you talk about this fancy reinforcement learning, ah, okay, so you wanna, you wanna basically, so the learning algorithm, I have to, if I'm in state S1 and I take action A1 and it brings me in a good state, whatever it means, I don't, still don't know. If, I, if it brings me in good state, I give a reward to action one for state one. So, and if I visit that 10 times, 10 times I give rewards, so I add the rewards, I add the rewards. So I'm accumulating rewards. So this starts from zero or a random number like any other weights that we used in previously, but then you add things up, and then that becomes a gigantic spot in the table. So, so what is the reinforcement learning goal? Find high star 
which maps S to A using the return function of S and A and a suitable return horizon. Is it finite? Is it infinite? What is it? But we are skipping something. So I have made it too simple. There is one question that if you don't know the answer for that, this is not easily possible. Do we know the transition probability of S A S prime? Do I know that? If I don't know that, that filling that table is not easy. I cannot come up with a reasonable algorithm to push things toward convergence. Do I know the transition probability? So again, so I'm right now at the fifth floor, and I look at the three elevators, and I'm in charge, and I say, OK, the left one, go down. The middle one, stay here. The right one go up. This is my action. So what would be the next state? Will the left one go to the fourth floor, third floor, second floor? I don't know, I, because I don't know who pressed the button. <laughs> it's a stochastic. So what is the value of the next state? Will the next state will be a better one or worse one? So we have two potential approaches. We have two potential approaches. First, find the value of the state OK? So find a way, find a way that if I move my figures on my chessboard, for every configuration, you can give me a numbers. You say, the value of this configuration is this. Or you look at, you take a snapshot at the position of the robot or the elevator, and you say, the value of this location is this. The value that this elevator is here, this elevator is here, this one is going up, this state, is the value is this. Can you do that? I imagine that to be very difficult. How do I know the value when I look at the chess game? In the middle of the game, nobody knows what is going on. How do I know I'm in a good state, in a good situation? How do I know that? I don't. It's a stochastic environment. This is mine telling me it's a 649, because we don't have a clock here. OK, we have one more minute. That's good. So second, I would say this is difficult. Second, find the value of the action. I would say this is easier. It's not easy, but it's easier. So instead of telling me what is the value of the board or the location of the elevators or the position of the robot, tell me was the action that they took good or bad? So tell me the value of the action. OK, don't forget, n is a million. m is 10, 20. So this is an extremely narrow and high matrix. Because usually we have a very small number of actions, but we have a gigantic amount of states. 
OK, so it should be easier to deal with actions than with the states. OK. So for this guy, we usually go toward dynamic programming. Dynamic programming, if, if I upset some colleagues, is not considered AI. I didn't say it. It's in the textbooks. This guy is model-free RL agent. is part of AI. So if, if you want to know the value of the state, you have to know the transition probabilities. That's an old research field in operation research and dynamic programming. Uh, people know that. It has nothing to do with AI. If I can observe my system to figure out these probabilities, I can come up with a model. But if I come up with a model, that's not AI. Because you didn't learn the model. You just came up with a set of equations. Dynamic programming is all about equations, from Bellman equations and more. But this one, action, model-free reinforcement learning, we want to focus on that. And hopefully on Thursday, we get a better picture and we can come up with the first simple algorithm for reinforcement learning agents. Just one more point. Uh, I'm thinking about slashing that last assignment and make it a quiz, if everybody's OK with that. If one of you complains, I cannot do it. So class reps, let me know. Or if uh, until tomorrow I don't hear anybody complain from anybody, the last assignment will be a quiz. <laughs>